We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. This God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. Oh my God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out. Forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We are the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're honored free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the We'll shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. But we'll shout out of your praise. Our joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. No, we'll shout out of your praise. Welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. I'm Cody, I am the digital pastor here, and before anything else, we need you to hear this, that we are a no matter church. And what that means is no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or even what's been done to you, we need you to hear God loves you, and you can look for him here with us. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to be perfect to be here. We are really glad that you're here. And if you are newer, or you haven't taken that step in becoming known, uh, we would love to help you take that step here today. So if you take that bold step as a thank you, I'll send you an Amazon gift card. And all you have to do is fill out our welcome card. It takes about 30 seconds and you can get to that by texting PLC to 99581. And one of the next steps that we take here is serving purposefully. And practically, all of our ministry happens. Uh, we are able to have online services in part because of our volunteer team. We couldn't do it without them. So we have volunteers that serve in many different capacities and uh, we just hear regularly that when someone signs up for a team, uh, they are with a group of people uh, that they are making impact in together. 
And that is when Prairie Lakes uh, starts to feel more than just a place they attend, but it starts to feel like home and like a family. So if you want to learn more or sign up to serve, even here at our online campus, you can again text PLC to 99581. And the next step that we talk about every single week is giving generously. And when you give to Prairie Lakes Church, you partner with us in changing lives here in the state and beyond. So if you wanna give right now, you can do so online by going to prairielakes.org forward slash give. And you can select your campus from the drop down. We're gonna continue. It's our final week of our parenting series. So let's kick to Pastor John. Hey, Prairie Lakes. It's, it's so great that we get to do this together every weekend. So you've made a great choice. So thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for, for jumping in. And you can't ever forget this about Prairie Lakes. We're a no matter church. And here's what that means. No matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done or even what's been done to you, God loves you. And you can't change that, okay? He does, he does. And our prayer is simply this, that this will be a place for you to go, I can at least begin to explore the journey. You don't have to believe everything. You don't have to get the right haircut. You don't have to have everything figured out. But man, this is a place. This is a place where you and anybody in your little Iowa, your friendship circle, can walk in and go on the journey. So we're really glad that we get to do this together. All right, family, we are on week five of this series called How to Help My Kids. And we've spent four weeks up to this point walking through really what we think are pretty weighty and timely issues uh, for parenting. And listen, it's not lost on us that not everybody's parents, but here's what we know. These truths are transferable. Whether you're an aunt and uncle, a grandpa and grandma, whether you yeah, got a coach or a teacher, uh, they're, they're really transferable. So we're in week five. And, and in week five, um, we're going to talk about how to help my kids be safe. Okay, so, so let's just sit on this for a minute. Everybody wants safe. It's just a given. Okay, nobody says, oh, I, want my, I don't care about safety. No, it's safe is a good thing, right? There isn't one of us, we don't want harm to come to my kids or, or my grandkids or my nieces and nephew. And, and in fact, you know what, I want it, I want safe for my grandkids so bad, right? So bad that, that I'd like to do this to all of them. Come here, buddies, come here, come here. I, there, here's what I would like to do, come here, come on. All right, hey everybody, this is Owen, this is Owen. And Owen, how old are you? Five. He's five. You're, no, you're six. you're six now, that's right. Come here, Jackaroo. And this is Jack and he's two. And, and I love these two of my 11 grandkids. I love them so much. I just want them to be safe all the time. In fact, here's how I want them to be. Here's how badly I want them to be safe, okay? This is, this is how badly I want this for them, okay? You hold that right there, buddy. And this is, this is what I want for my grandkids. I just want to wrap them up and I don't want anything ever to go bad with them and I don't want ever to get a scratch or get their feelings hurt in any way. In fact, this is all I want is just that the whole, whoops, sorry about that. Sorry, little buddy. Oh, sorry, little buddy. I just really, all I want is for them to just be safe. That's all I want. And if I could wrap all my grandkids up in bubble wrap, it would be the best thing ever. But here's what we know, family. Safe is a good thing, but it's not the only thing. And we can't do this to our kids. All right, you guys, go that way. Let's see this happen. Okay, go play in the street now. Go ahead. <laughs> no grandchildren were harmed in the filming of this video. <laughs> Little technical difficulties there. But right, safe is a great thing. And, and, and all of us, we, we want that for, for our kids. Listen, we do, but, but, but listen, my friends, it, safe alone isn't enough. It just, it just can't be. Now let's just, let's just get to this truth real quick here, okay? The reality is we only have so much capacity when it comes to keeping our kids safe. And as they grow, um, our control and our capacity to control that, it diminishes as they grow, right? And, and, and it should, it's kind of a normal adulting thing. Now, let me just say this. Listen, this is not overlooking that I know that some of you, some of you weren't safe as kids. And that's a, that's a difficult, difficult thing. And, and some of you, um, 
uh, had adults in your life that didn't keep you safe. So in no way are we saying, you know, common sense is, 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 is being thrown out. But listen, here's what we've done for the last four weeks, okay? We, we've taught you to, to, to ask questions and to be engaged and be the parent and use the tools for, for online and phones and for tracking them. We, we've taught you to ask the questions and be interruptible and, and be available to, to be aware of the, the appropriate talking spot for, for each kid. Uh, we, we've taught you to not to put your kids in bad situations. We've taught you to say no a lot, okay? Listen, all that is true. All that's applicable, but here's what we can't do. We can't bubble wrap our kids and have safe as the only goal. And in fact, if, if we do that, too safe will actually harm our kids. Never taking a risk because we bubble wrap our kids will stunt their growth. If they never fall down, they never learn how to get back up. Risk-averse kids turn into risk-averse adults. And let's just say this out loud, right? No war has ever been won or business started or justice served or kingdom ground taken by people whose main goal in life is to be risk averse. It just doesn't happen. The main goal is safety. My friends, safe is good, okay? Safe is good. But safe and is better. So here's what I want to talk about this weekend. I'm going to give you two of these. And here's the first one, and we're going to be in two scripture passages. I want to talk about how to help my kids be safe and, safe and. And so here's the first one that we're going to hit. I want my kids to be safe and sent, okay? Safe and sent. Now, you may not be there yet, but God does have a plan and a purpose for your kids' lives. He does, and, and, and he's got a purpose that's, that for your kid that's far greater and far better and far more important than any purpose that you've set out or planned that you have for your own children. You may not believe this. You may not be there, yes, but God has the best plan for your kids. In fact, he does for, for, for all of us. And, and here, here's the issue, right? Here's the issue when it comes to this. And me as a, as a parent and now a grandparent, here's the issue. I know, but I don't want to give up control. Listen, we encounter this one all the time. The control issue comes up all the time. I have, I have several guys right now in my little Iowa who are this close, right? They're, they're this close to stepping over the faith line and trusting Jesus, right? What we mean by that is this. They're this close to surrendering to Jesus and saying, I trust you. I confess that I'm a sinner and I believe that you're my only hope. And they come to Jesus, they're this close, they're this close, almost always. I've encountered this most of my life. And especially with these last couple of guys I'm working with right now, here's the issue. But I don't want to give up control. I don't want to give up control. And here's my favorite line. Hey, let's get a piece of paper out right now. And I want you to write down, tell me exactly what you're in control of. Are you in control of your health? Well, not really. Are you in control of the weather? Not really. Are you in control of how your car's gonna break? Not really. And if we start getting down to it, right, we, we, just, we just don't. And you can fight against that all you want when it comes to parenting. But, but here's the deal, you've gotta to get to this spot, we have to get to this spot, that my friends, listen, we're not in control. We're not. And if you'll let him, God will have a plan for your kids, or your grandkids, or your nieces and nephews that's far better than yours. I want you to see a, a kind of a picture of this becoming a realization. Everybody in your Bible, let's turn to Luke chapter 2, okay? So, so remember the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Luke is the third one, okay? So everybody go to Luke chapter 2. And in Luke chapter 2, we have this story of, of Jesus uh, as a boy. Now listen, we have nothing uh, almost nothing about Jesus as a child, okay? So, so remember that Matthew and, and Luke and John, they talk about the birth story, right? They, they talk about that. Um, and, and, and it's silent. The Bible is silent on the childhood of Jesus, except for this spot right here. So everybody, Luke chapter 2, and, and, and let's walk down it, okay? So here's what it says. In verse 41, it says, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. So they, they traveled to Jerusalem, as all observant Jews would. They would all travel to observe the Passover uh, in Jerusalem. Now, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. Okay, so remember, this is Jesus at 12 years old now, okay? Now, after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but they were unaware of it. You're like, wow, what? how could that happen? Well, it, it, it kind of explains it, okay? 
In verse 44 it says, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Okay, so right now I, I just know, just, just put yourself in this spot when after the end of the day, you, you, you start to discover that you're missing your kid. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends, right? So this isn't like Mary and Joseph are horrible parents, right? I left my kid in the car in the parking lot once for a little bit, but I, that was, it wasn't bad, okay? The windows were open. But, but, but Mary and Joseph, they, they traveled with their clan and their family, and it was a big, big group of people. So they just thought, he's with us. He's just with one of the uncles or aunts or something, right? He's with, he's with one of them. So, so here's what they did. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now catch this. After three days, they found him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Okay, so just time out from the story for a minute. I, I mean, I, uh, about three weeks ago, I was in charge of three or four of our kids, and one of them I just couldn't see in the moment. And there was probably a 30-second gap where I didn't see him. And in that 30 seconds, my heart started to beat, right? 30 seconds, my heart started to go, okay, um, okay, uh, right? And it does that. Now imagine this. One day they were traveling. They came back to Jerusalem and looked for him for three days. Four days, right? Four days he's missing. So, so Mama Mary says this, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And then here's Jesus at 12. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So, so just, just get this picture for a minute. There's this moment in Mary's life where she knows, right? This is a miraculous birth, right? So she knows this. But there's this moment when she had to be reminded again. This isn't really my kid. He belongs to the king. This, this kid belongs to God. There is this moment when, when she had to realize that God has a plan for this kid that's, that's going to be, be different than, than her plan. It, 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 it's, it's going to be. And there is this moment when, when Mary again needed to be reminded that I have a kid who was loaned to me from God, just like all of our children, loaned from God, who God has a plan for and a mission for and a plan that he wants to send them on. My friends, listen, safe is great. Oh, I want my kids to be safe. I want nothing to go wrong. Nothing. But safe alone isn't it. It's safe and. And our parenting posture needs to be this. Oh, I want my kids to be safe and I want them to be sent. To be sent to be the woman or the man, the girl or the boy who God has called them to be. God called him to be. And this is a tough one, right? And this one has to be learned over and over again. In fact, there's, a, there's another really kind of interesting story. It's in Mark. It, it's, it's Jesus who's, who's now, as the Messiah, he's now teaching crowds and, 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 and he's, you know, he's fully, he's fully um, being recognized and, and he's calling himself the Messiah, right? So it's in the middle of his ministry after age 30. So this is, you know, 20 years later or, or, or 12 years later, you know, or something like that. And, 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 and so, 18 years later, so, so somewhere in there, um, mom has to be reminded again. In fact, it's in the book of Mark, and it says he's teaching, and he's teaching with a bunch of people. And when his family heard about this, right, that he was being overrun by these crowds, everybody trying to get him, family heard about this. They went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Right, just one more moment. When, 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 Brothers and family and mama had to be reminded of this. That this kid belongs to God. And God's got a special purpose and a special plan and this kid's being sent. And my friends, it's not just Jesus, it's all of our kids. You see, God's plan for your kid is always better than your plan. And I'm gonna tell you this, it's always riskier. And the parental temptation is to always take control. It can be easy to be safe, but not safe and. And our best parenting posture is to know that our kids are safe, keep them safe, and know that they're sent. I'll never forget this when <laughs> I'm in, I'm in uh, college in the University of Sioux Falls, and uh, I, I get called, I feel called, I, become a, I, I stepped over the faith line in college, 
And, and about three years or two and a half, three years after I became a follower of Jesus, I was still at college. That's like on the five or six year plan. And uh, somewhere in there, there was this clear call to be a pastor, to go to seminary and be a pastor. And I can remember going home to my dad and, uh, <laughs> and sitting down with him and, and telling him, hey, I think, I think God's, I think I'm going to go be a pastor. I'm going to go to seminary. I think God's calling me. And, and here's my dad's quote, okay? Now listen, this is what my dad said. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> I, can, I can just picture him sitting across the table kind of looking at me. Why would you want to do that, okay? Because, you know, his plan for my life, and listen, here's the circumstances of my dad's life. He was the chair of the board at this church in Wyoming, and it was messy, okay? And he watched this pastor who was his friend just get chewed up by people, and the board attacking him, and things going wrong, and money problems, right? So my dad is on the board, and he's witnessing this, and he's trying to navigate this, this, this bad situation. And his son comes in and says, I want to be in the spot that you're trying to help your friend, the pastor, in, and it's a bad spot to be in. My dad wanting nothing more than me to be safe and have a safe career, right? And my friends, listen, all of our kids, safe and sent. Safe and sent. God's got a plan, and it's better than anyone that we have. So the question really is, then how do I do that, right? How do I help my kids be safe and sent? I'm going to give you three of them real quickly. Now listen, mom and dad, grandpa, grandpa, aunt and uncle, okay, listen, Model the scent life in front of them, okay? Model the scent life in, in, in front of them. Let them see your journey. You, you, you may say, yeah, but I'm not a pastor or I'm not a missionary, so I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have this. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, listen, I know some of you aren't yet. I know some of you aren't yet. But, but if you are and when you get to be, you are just as sent as the pastor is. You are just as called out to serve him as I am. And as your CP is, okay, all of us are. So, so model the sent life in front of them. What's that look like? Here's what it looks like. Let your kids see you. Take a risk with some neighbors on some invites and some risky conversations. Let them see you praying over their names. Let them see you reaching across the fence. Let them see you doing everything that you can in your little Iowa to help people see Jesus in them, in you. Here's another one. You step into ministry roles. Right? How do you model? You step into ministry roles that challenge you or challenge your comfort and convenience. You serve. You, you, you serve in the way that helps the kingdom grow and helps the church. That's what you do. You, you serve. Let them see that in you. How do you model it? You, you, you tithe and you give generously as a picture of what a Jesus follower does. Yeah, I could sure take that 10% and I could do a lot, but you know what? When you model that risky financial step, when you model that, your kids get to see that. They get to see this thing called the scent life and how God can bless it. You, you, how do you model it? You go and help when your friend's life fa falls apart at midnight. When, when they say you running to help a friend that's hit the bottom. That's how you model the scent life. It means you have an open door and an empty seat at the table. So just in case God drops somebody by, you're ready for him. You prioritize your time with Jesus and his church above other things. You model it. How do I help my kids be safe and sent? I model it. Second way is this. I put them in front of other people who are also doing that. Being very, very, I want you to have as many friends as you can have, but I want you to have some friends that you want your kids to emulate. So get some friends in your life so that your kids can see them modeling this Jesus life, this sent life in front of them. And here's the third one. Let them go and try. Let them go and try. I love the story of Savannah Davis, our, the Cedar Falls mid-pastor, Savannah. When she was a, a kid, she always thought she wanted to be a missionary. And so she's a teenager, and she wants to be a missionary. So when she's 16, you know what her parents do? They let her go and try. <laughs> they send her to a, a mission in Mexico for the entire summer. Okay, and, and, and listen, she didn't become a missionary in another country, but she became a missionary in this country, modeling the scent life in front of a bunch of junior high kids. So my friends, just, just, just hear this, okay? Just, just hear this from me. Safe is great. Oh, I want my kids to be safe. But safe and sent is better. This is perhaps the most difficult thing for a person or a parent to do. Helping them discover and helping yourself remember whose kid this really is. Safe and sent is a much 
better parenting posture. So there's one. Let's go to two now. All right. So how to help my kids be safe and sent and safe and savvy. How do I help my kids be safe and savvy? All right. So, so here's what everybody to do. I want you to go to the second place in the Bible that we're going to hit. And I want you to go to Matthew chapter 10. Okay. So you're in Luke now. Just turn to the left and go to Matthew chapter 10. And there's this, <laughs> there's this passage it is so great, and there's this one, there's one verse we're going to sit on. It'll be up on the screen in a minute, but it's just, this, this is crazy, okay? So let me give you the context of this. So this is Jesus. Matthew 10 is Jesus sending out his disciples, right? He's, he's sending them out to be, to be the, the, the workers, right? He sends out the 12 to, 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 to go, right? So here they are, safe and sent, right? And so he talks to them, and he names the disciples, and he says, now here's how I want you to do this, and and, um, if the, and go, go to like verse 13. It says, oh, if the, if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, right? So he's, he's giving them all these instructions. Then he says this crazy sounding phrase in verse 16. And look what it says. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, now let's just, before we get to the end, just, just sit for a minute. Here's the picture, sheep among wolves. All right, so that's not a pretty picture, okay? That's, that's got danger written all over it. And he says, since you are going out into this dangerous place, into this dangerous world, therefore, stay home, pull your, pull your quilt up and hunker down. Nope. He says, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Okay, <laughs> right? Snakes and doves, they don't, they don't seem to fit. And, and especially like, if I were to be described as be, be like a dove, you're like, well, you know, I can handle that. Dove is the international sign of peace and calm. And you know me, I love doves. I love when they coo, I love their thing, right? So that's really great. But, but I don't know one person that says, would you please, I want to be described as a snake. Please, please call me a serpent, right? Nobody. So, so what's Jesus up to here, right? What, what, what's going on when he says, I'm sending you, right? There's that scent life. And it's sheep among wolves. It's a dangerous. Be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. So, so just, just sit with Jesus just for a minute in this one. Now, Jesus would never call us to be like, we, we see the word snake and we think of, the, you know, the Genesis 3 where, where Satan was, a, was a, the form of a serpent, right? And, and everybody's like afraid of snakes and they're cursed to crawl on the ground, right? So we think of all that. But, but Jesus wouldn't ask us to be that. And he wouldn't ask us to be dishonest or, or disingenuous or sneaky. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything that you'd describe a snake as, right? He wouldn't, he wouldn't do that. So, so, so what's Jesus up to in this one? Savvy means to combine discerning wisdom, okay? Savvy means combine discerning wisdom. Now think of the serpent, think of the snake just for a minute. And, 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 and listen to this, this description. Snakes do not rely so much on conventional sensory input, such as their eyes and their ears and their nose. They have specialized sensory organs that pick up thermal readings, vibrations through their jaw bones, and scent particles in the air with their tongue, which they touch to a highly sensitive organ called the Jacobson organ in the roof of their mouth. Right, so just picture the snake, they're always, right? They're always doing this, and that, that's, that's one of their sensory, that's, that's, how they, that's, how they, that's how they sense things. In short, snakes discern, now listen to this, this is, this is very cool. Snakes discern what others don't see, hear, or smell in the natural. Through this organ, the Jacobson's organ, they translate what they see in the air. Snakes are discerners. So think of that for a minute. Snakes are discerners, right? So here's what savvy is. Savvy is a discerning wisdom. That wisdom that you, that you kind of get when you sense something isn't quite right. That wisdom that says, you know what? That's a crowd I don't really want to be around. That wisdom that says, you know, that feels like a deal that I shouldn't be involved with. There's that, this discerning wisdom that sometimes always isn't just right in front of you, but it's something you just kind of sense. This doesn't feel right to me. The environment that I'm in, I'm, I'm discerning my environment. So, so think of that for your kids. You want them to be safe. 
And you want them to be the savvy. And part of savvy is you want them to have discerning wisdom in whatever environment they're in. Discerning wisdom. I know I told you I was going to go to two passages, but I want to go back to the Luke one real quick, okay? I want you to see something. I've, you're in Matthew now, so go back over to Luke 2 real quick. I, I never noticed this before until I was studying for, for, for this one. And, and there's, there's kind of two times um, when, when Mary has this kind of pondering thing uh, that, that, that happens to her, Okay. So in Luke 2, in verse 19, after the shepherds, they, the shepherds come, right, and the, the birth narrative, the shepherds. And it says in 19, it says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned and they, they glorified God. Um, and, 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 right, so, so she, she had to ponder this. The, the mama had to ponder. And, and the, the, the second time it, it says this, right, the second time it says this is, is, is where we were just at. Look down to verse 51 at the end of it. It says, then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But Mary, his mother, treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew, now listen to this, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The second place that's said is she pondered after the shepherds and she pondered when he was 12. But after the shepherd's story, and after Simeon and Anna, look at verse 39, it says, When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. So two descriptions of Jesus as a child, and both of them involved this thing called wisdom, and both of them involved his mama pondering these things in her heart. So just hear this from me. One of the gifts we have to give our children is, is appropriate safety and a savviness in this world. And a savviness in this world where Jesus says to his disciples, now you be like wise as serpents. And he was saying, have discerning wisdom to discern your environment. Okay? And, 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 and then he says this on the other side of that loop. There's that passage where he says, he says, and like a dove, right? Innocent as a dove. And that's an easy one, right? That's an easy one to see. Peaceable and kind, um, innocence. A gentleness is the other word for that one. A strong gentleness that doesn't blind you to the dangers around you. So not a gentleness or an innocence that's kind of like naive or wussiness or just kind of stupid, but a but a gentleness that is, that is strong, like the gentleness Jesus displayed. So let's put this together now. Savvy means to combine a discerning wisdom, like a serpent, with a strong gentleness, like a dove. Your kids and mine, our kids, I don't want just safe kids. Oh, I want them to be safe, yes. But I want them to be safe and savvy. I, 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 I want to guard them, right? And, 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 and I want to guard them, and, but, but I can't just guard them and keep them safe. I have to equip them to guard themselves with savviness. You have to teach them to be savvy in the world at the end of the day wants to chew them up. It does. And if they don't make the move to safe and savvy and they just say safe, then they will always be vulnerable. Always. So let's answer the question, how then, right? How do I help my kids be safe and savvy? Three of them. Here's the first one. We've got to teach them to be paying attention to their environment. Remember the snake, right? Always aware of what's going on around them. We've got to teach our kids that. Always be aware of what's going on around them. Always kind of heads up and eyes open. Okay, now listen, this isn't something that happens overnight. But man, you can start teaching your kids this to start, start being a little more discerning with, with how kids are behaving. Or, or, or the group they're hanging out with, right? Or, or how the group they're hanging out with is kind of influencing them. Or if there's some kids that are getting in trouble, are they a part of that group or they, are they not a part of that group, right? Or, or if they're in an environment like a party where they, where they just kind of start to sense this isn't right, this isn't right, we've got to teach them to have this wisdom, right? This discerning wisdom says, I'm, I'm getting out of here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm getting out. So, so help them pay attention to their environment. And one of the best ways for you to do that, moms and dads, is this. 
Just ask them questions. Help them see things when you're there. And you can say, you know what I noticed? That little Jimmy, he, he, when he gets nervous, he always acts like this. And that's when he gets in trouble, right? So wh whatever it is, right? Here's the second one. Not only paying attention to their environment on the outside of them, but paying attention to their inner environment. And this is what we'd call emotional health. You've got to start working with your kids now. As, as whatever age and stage they're at, you've got to start helping them. Why do I feel? The, what's going on inside of me? What's the environment of my soul? What's in my spirit? What, what's happening? Why am I mad? Why am I sad? Why am I angry? What's bugging me? And man, listen to this. The more you can help your kids kind of understand their inner environment, the savvier they are going to be in their behavior. And Jesse talked about that last week. All right, here's the third one. Paying attention to the environment, to their inner environment, and paying attention to how their actions affect others. Okay, now just, just hear me out and listen for a minute. When I'm safe and sent, and when I'm safe and savvy, I need to be paying attention to how my behavior affects other people. As a savvy, um, discerning wisdom combined with Com com combined with, um, uh, what do we say, wisdom combined with, with strong gentleness, right? W when I have that, I want to be able to be aware of how my kindness or my meanness affects the people around me. How my behavior can either pick a kid's day up or can bring a kid's day down. You know, all of us have these stories of our kids, or you have your own stories, or your kids, or your grandkids, when somebody says something mean to them, or picks on them, and you just want to take that little kid and go, bam, like, we can't do that, okay? But, but right, you just get so frustrated with that. Why can't you just be kind? Your behavior has affected this kid. Remember this, uh, when the previous church, we had a, a gal, um, just this beautiful family. They had three daughters, and, and they're just, just beautiful. And one of the daughters always wore her hair way down here. And her mom said to me one day, she said to me, you know why she does that? When she was in third grade, some boy said, your eyebrows look like caterpillars. And she went through her entire high school career covering her eyebrows. I want my kids to be safe and savvy. And I want them to know this, that their actions affect others. And I want their actions to be like Jesus said, to be a strong gentleness and the discerning wisdom. All right, mama, dad, grandpa, grandma, aunts, and uncles, if your kids aren't savvy, they'll never be safe. Safe and sent. Safe and savvy. That's the parenting posture that's gonna make a difference. Thank you, Pastor John. And our desire is that the Lord would be with you, that he would help you, that he would support you, and because that's our desire, we want to sing a song that is actually a prayer over you and your family, a prayer or a song of blessing. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're with your family, uh, sit together. You can even hold hands if you want. And just be together in this moment. So let's transition to song um, and encourage you to just sit in this moment together with your whole family. Yeah. 
As we just saying, our desire, our prayer for you is that the Lord would bless you and keep you. So that is our prayer for you as we enter into this next week. We're so glad you uh, took the time to be here with us today. Um, kids, don't run off yet. In just one minute, children's programming will begin. And everyone else, we'll see you back next week for a brand new series. Do you want to hear a joke? Sure, why not? Okay, this is a good one. I've thought long and hard on it. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. okay. What do you call a kangaroo covered in tape? I have no idea. Think about it. What were we just doing? No? Hopscotch. Get it? You know, such a mean slapper. No. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Let's try another one. Let's try another one. What do you call a bunny wearing a kilt playing the bagpipes? Think about it. I have no idea. Hopscotch. Are jokes supposed to be funny, Addy? <laughs> All right, kids. 
let's jump into this week's video before Addie tries to make any more awful hopscotch jokes. Hey, I thought it was a good one. story but falling down isn't the end of the story not if you have resilience resilience is getting back up when something gets you down but you don't need resilience when your balance is as good as mine of course that was going forward the true test is walking the balance beam backwards like so Ignore that. <laughs> the true test of mastering the balance beam is walking backwards. It shouldn't matter if. Okay, that is not Come on, come on, come on, no, no, please. Huh? I guess it's easier to keep your balance if you're watching where you're going. And sometimes, as you'll see in today's story, it helps to look backwards. Woo! Now I'm getting it. Now I got it. I oh wait, I got it. I got it. No! I'm just gonna stay down here for a while. I'll come back. The Bible 
It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story. Inspired by the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Some days, some weeks, even some years seem hard. You feel like staying in bed and tugging the covers over your head. You feel like you can't face what's out there. The person who wrote the book of Hebrews knew all about that feeling. We don't know for sure who they were, but we do know this person loved God deeply. They understood that the more we discover about what God has done in the past, the more we can trust God to act now. Listen to Hebrews 11. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. It is being sure of what we do not see. That is what the people of long ago were praised for. Faith is not just about blindly hoping for the best when we get out of bed. It's taking a long look at the big picture of God's work through history and trusting that God can work out all the hard parts of our story too. The writer of Hebrews goes on to talk about dozens of men and women who faced difficult times yet still trusted God. Men and women who got back up even when things seemed impossible. Just think about Abraham. When he was 75 years old, living a comfortable life, God called him. Abram. Abram spun around. Vast darkness stretched around him while stars wheeled overhead. There's no one. It must be. Is it God? The people of Haran worshipped many false gods, thinking they were real. Abram knew this was something different, someone different. Leave your country and your people. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. You will be a blessing to others. The words of the Lord were staggering. Though Abram had no children now, God promised him enough kids and grandkids to fill an entire country. Okay, God. We read in Hebrews, Abraham had faith, so he obeyed God. He did it even though he didn't know where he was going. Abraham listened. Abraham trusted God, and his journey of faith into the unknown led to God's miracle gift of a son, Isaac. In fact, the entire story of God's people starts with Abraham's simple act of faith. Now let's take a look at Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph. Joseph had faith. Joseph was daddy's favorite, with a colorful coat to prove it. He was even cocky enough to share his dreams with his older brothers. There were 11 stars. That, that's you guys bowing down to me. Joseph's brothers were so angry, they sold him as a slave. Joseph ended up in faraway Egypt, forced to work hard. But instead of sulking, he made a choice to trust God. He forged ahead and did the work in front of him. Over the years, Joseph's situation changed from good to bad, to good to bad, to good again. In each case, Joseph got back up again and trusted God to work out his story. In the end, Joseph was made second in command to the Egyptian pharaoh. I am putting you in charge of the whole land. In this position, Joseph was able to save his entire family, God's people, when a famine struck. Hundreds of years later, God's people, the Israelites, had grown into a great nation, but they were forced to work as slaves. So God called a man named Moses. Moses had faith. Moses, an Israelite, had been raised as the Pharaoh's grandson. But when he grew up, he ran away from Egypt. He lived a quiet life until God called him from a burning bush. Moses, Moses. Here I am. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. The place you are standing 
is holy ground. Moses was an old man by this time. He probably didn't want to start a brand new adventure, but God called him to face down the Pharaoh of Egypt. The Lord says, let my people go. Moses chose to trust God. He led the Israelites out of Egypt and through the waters of the Red Sea, even as the Pharaoh chased them. For 40 years, Moses led the Israelites through the desert, facing attacks from the outside and complaints from the people. Oy, we had it better in Egypt. And at long last, Moses himself was able to glimpse the land God had promised Abraham so long before. Abraham, Joseph, and Moses are just a few of the people we read about in Hebrews. Enoch, Noah, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, David, Samuel, and the prophets. These people did amazing things through faith. But faith in God doesn't mean that everything will work out perfectly. It means we can keep going because God knows the end of the story and promises to make everything right, both for these individuals in Hebrews, but also for us. We have an incredible opportunity. When we choose to trust God and get back up, we continue the story of these amazing men and women in Hebrews. And no matter what we face each day, we can know that God has planned the perfect end to our story. On a balance beam, you can keep your balance because you can see where you're going. But real life is different than a balance beam. You don't always know what's going to happen next. Your path might take a sudden turn. You might even. Having resilience means getting back up when something gets you down. That's easy to say, but a lot harder to do. What if you don't feel like getting back up? How do you keep going when giving up feels easier? Well, you could try looking backward. I don't mean literally looking behind you. Huh. I mean, look back in time to people who came before you. How did they handle life when it got hard? How did they keep going? One place you can look is the Bible. The Bible is filled with stories of people who dealt with all kinds of troubles and time and time again, the way they made it through was by trusting in God. You see, God loves you. Plus God is always with you. And on top of that, God knows what you're going through and what you will go through. When you put your trust in God, it means you believe that God is in control. And knowing that can give you the strength to keep going. So here's the one thing to remember today. Trusting God can help you get back up. People who came before you trusted God to guide their steps. You can trust God too. Doesn't mean you won't, you won't, you're gonna fall. But trusting God and remembering the people who've come before can remind you to get back up. Maybe I put too much wax on the balance beam? Huh. Yeah. Whoa, see you next time. <laughs> okay, hold on. I got it. I got it. I got it. I don't got it. I don't got it. I don't got it.